If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 18. Exodus 18. All right, let me give you the outline. Uh, the title of my message tonight is Shared Ministry. Shared Ministry. And uh, it is uh, very important, and uh, I'm excited about uh, the lesson tonight. Number one, a sweet reunion. Don't you like sweet re- reunions? <laughs> I do. I, I remember my mom's side, the Lopez family. We had one every summer in Binger, Oklahoma, a uh, town of about 400 north of Lawton there, and uh, we had some sweet re- reunions. Number two, a time of sharing, and a time of sharing, and we all enjoy times of sharing. And then a lesson on delegation, a lesson on delegation. And, uh, you know, it's hard when you're a leader sometimes to delegate things and uh you know it's it's not wrong not to but it's better if you do Uh, and i'll be sharing that uh here in just a few minutes and we know all that's been going on in exodus you know when you look at verse 18 and and of course you know we're coming up to exodus 20 uh so we know the ten commandments we know all that had been going on and what was going on historically uh, but uh, this particular chapter uh, is really, it, it's a great example of uh, taking care of a lot of people. Because you think about it, Moses' job was take, to take care of two million Jews. Now, can you imagine that leader of two million people, all right? And you know how they were, uh, you know, as long as they had food, but you know, they run out of water earlier and they're griping, you know, did you leave us to die out here? You know, they run out of food and they, you know, blaming Moses. And, you know, Moses was always going on their behalf and uh, speaking with the Lord. Uh, but this, this chapter here is just kind of a, a pause uh, before, you know, the Ten Commandments and, you know, what he, between the crossing of the Red Sea and the Ten Commandments, Uh, That's what Moses is known for. So let's start reading in verse 1 of chapter 18, a sweet reunion. And Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. And we know uh, Jethro was a Gentile priest, and uh, that's kind of an odd combination uh, especially at that time, because uh, most of the priests of those days were Jewish, but obviously he was a spiritual man, and uh, he was a father-in-law of Moses, and he got to know Moses. You know, we all know the story of him running, and you know, the thing I remember about Moses is he slew an Egyptian in anger, and folks, God can forgive any sin. Uh, the only sin he does not forgive is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and not accepting him. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, I've heard many uh, authentic stories and, of where people have done some really bad things and run, you know, got thrown in jail. And uh, yet God in that jailhouse uh, came to him, you know, came to, the, to a person and it totally changed his life. And uh, the same thing can be true of Moses. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back with her two sons, whom the name one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. In the name of the other, Eliezer, he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the uh, Pharaoh, sword of Pharaoh. So I think it's interesting how he named his kids, you know, with these you know, explanations of what the, the name, and he had been away from his family for a while because, of course, the travel uh, there was very slow. And it said, and Jethro's, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was camped at the Mount of God. And, of course, Mount Sinai uh, is the mount there. Now he had said to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to you with your wife, and her two sons with her. So we knew and know that, uh, you know, seeing his family again and being with them uh, was a really, really sweet time. Uh, Psalm 55. Psalm 55, verse 14. 
The Bible says, and we, and we took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in throng. And again, you know, Moses, and when you talk about a father-in-law, you know, he would have been older, he would have been a priest, he would have been a spiritual man, and uh, probably him and Moses had a real good relationship uh, when he was uh, there in Midian. And so, you know, even at that, uh, folks, that, that's one thing I, I, as I was growing up, I always, and my dad taught me this, uh, to respect your elders and to look to them for wisdom, okay? And I'm sure this was what Moses was, you know, that, that relationship that he had with his father-in-law, and we know that uh, it, it was a good relationship. And then Psalm 133, and here... Uh, it's talking about, you know, just how fellowship uh, with people, with other Christians is a sweet thing. And I hope you understand in all that we teach and all that we do, it's okay to have verses and all that, but we need to make application in everything that we do. And, and this is more of an application thing. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And that, like I said, uh, folks, you only get one family. Uh, my mom has been gone, uh, let's see, seven years now. My father's been gone 12 years now. And, uh, we, you know, to this day, I still miss them and think of them often. And it is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron and running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon uh, descending on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessings, life forevermore. And it just talks about how, you know, when you get close to someone, and that's what I've learned in the ministry. Uh, I don't, I, I didn't think it would be that hard to leave home. Uh, we were 22 years old. The only person I knew at First Baptist Church of Alma was Bob Shelton. And to just, you know, you know, just by faith leave, it was extremely hard uh, the church was just running. We were running 1,100. You know, I, we got up to running about 200 in our youth group there. And uh, But I still have fellowship. Uh, I'm going back in September, and they are celebrating 75 years. And uh, they're going to have a weekend revival. And they've asked me to kick it off on a Wednesday night. And, uh, you know, I still have had people just say, hey, I know I haven't seen you in 40 years. Uh, they called me up. One guy called me up. He says, I'm going to be there. You know, and he doesn't even live. I'm trying to think of where he, he, he's like in South Carolina or something like that. But just that sweet fellowship that we have uh, with friends and with family is a really, really good thing. And I know Moses was glad to see his family. And the second thing is uh, time of sharing. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, bowed down, and kissed him. And again, you know, it's a messed up world today. <laughs> you do that today, and it's kind of, I'm like, no, 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 thank you. But that was their greeting at that time. And it was a thing of honoring him and respecting him. And they asked each other about their well-being, and they went into the tent. And Moses told the father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and all the hardships that had come up on them on the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. And folks, it's one thing to hear it secondhand. You know, he had heard what was going on, it said in the scripture we read, but to sit in the tent, breaking bread, having fellowship, getting it firsthand, and I can imagine him talking about the Red Sea, and just talking about all that was going on in there, and, and they were just having sweet fellowship. And the Bible says, in verse 9, then Jethro rejoiced for all the good which the Lord had done for Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. And again, it's always good to get a blessing from your father-in-law. And Lori's dad, I I'm just telling you at first, I was, I was just... When we were dating, I was scared of him. He, he was in the Marine Corps. He was, you know, and I'm talking hardcore. Uh, 
you know, I, I, he was intimidating. He, he wasn't a big talker. But I'm telling you, as I was in that family, he gave me some great advice. Uh, and we had a really, really good relationship. Verse 11, matter of fact, one thing that I did when we were growing up, I'd go over his house or Lori's house every, when we were dating even, I'd go over every Monday night, we'd watch Monday night football together. And even after we got married, I did the same thing. Uh, so uh, he, was a, he, was treasure, he was a deacon in our church, he was treasure in our church for a while there at Cameron Baptist. Now, I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods for the very thing which they behaved proudly, he was above them. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, uh, took a burnt offering and other sacrifices to offer to God. And, of course, that is just plain old worship, okay? Isn't it neat when you get with some people, it starts out as a catching up thing, and then even with some, I, I remember a deal, we had a youth minister's meeting at Glorietta, uh, New Mexico, and we went there, it was youth ministers, it was a, a retreat type deal, and it was a Friday, Saturday, and a Sunday, and I'm just telling you, that fellowship that Friday night was good, but Saturday night, about, about 10 of us from Oklahoma got together, and we just started talking about, you know, our, our situation and all, was going, all that was going on in our churches, and it ended up being a prayer meeting that busted up at 3 o'clock in the morning. It didn't start out like that. It was just fellowship. And, and I knew most of those guys, uh, you know, and, and again, I was a lot younger than them, uh, some of the ones that were there. But there was just something about that. It just truly turned into a worship time. And it says, And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses, Moses' father-in-law, uh, before God. And again, they were just rejoicing over what God has done. Look at Psalm 96. Psalm 96. Folks, we really do need to take some time to rejoice. Because you know what Satan likes us to do? Think about the negative things. He wants us to dwell on the negative things. And I tell you, I don't care who the individual is. I don't care who the church is. It, not everything's perfect. Not everything's, you know, roses. Okay, and what Satan does, he convinces you that the bad things outweigh the good things. But I'm, I am telling you, I am here to testify, even in my own life, in this, what I've been going through, you know, I am more blessed, I have more blessings than, than heartache, and we need to thank God for that. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, sing, the Lord, sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among the peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. Notice the not capitalized G. And notice the capitalized G is Jehovah God of the Bible. But the Lord made the heavens honor and majesty before him, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Folks, we all have something to praise God about. And we need to do that in our daily lives. In our daily lives, it's very, very important. Then Hebrews 10, and I know you know this one, but I just it just crossed my mind. You know, I just I just do what the Lord's Lord tells me to do. Hebrews 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast. Uh, let, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. And folks, God has never let you down. Now, he has not given you everything you wanted. Okay, we pray, and, and I, I think this is the biggest thing for some people. They want something so bad, and they pray, and they pray, and they pray, but they don't consider it might not be God's will. And they'll just they'll think, well, God let me down. Well, folks, God's never let you down. God's never lied to you. Every promise that he's written in the word of God is faithful and true. And let us consider one another in stirring up love and good works, 
not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as in the matter of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. And we know we are studying the day that is approaching, and that is the day of the Lord, folks. And here's the point in the fellowship. I don't know about you, but Sundays are my favorite day of the week. Absolute, hands down, no questions asked. You know, when I get here, and, and again, I, I, I'm hoping August the 3rd, he will put me back on my regular schedule. That's what I, I'm praying. That's what I'm believing uh, that this is going to happen. You know, it's one of those things is when I get up on Sunday morning, I have never said, well, since I've been a staff member, I have never said, I don't want to go to church today. Matter of fact, I told my dad that when I was uh, 15 years old, and he said, you know, if you want to live today, all right, I brought you in this world and I'll take you out. You get yourself out of bed and go to church. So we never had that discussion again, all right? Because my, I'm just telling you, my dad did not play. When he said something, it happened. But I'm just saying, uh, I look forward to Wednesday nights. I look forward to Sunday nights. Uh, just being with God's people and around God's people. Uh, right now, there's that, that, that Holy Spirit power that is, that is going on in our church. And, you know, uh, I just sense as we get into fall, we're going to be right back where... For, I hope you understand what a, what a spring we had there for a while. It was incredible how many people we were baptizing. And we have 67 additions, and it's only July. Folks, only God can do something like that. Okay, man cannot bring revival. Man cannot make these things happen. And don't ever take it for granted. All right? We can come to church. We have the freedoms. I have the freedom to, to speak and, and nobody censoring me. We can go into Sunday school class and have that small group. There are just so many things. And folks, I am telling you, Christian fellowship is awesome. Well, the third thing I want you to see, not only a sweet reunion and a time of sharing, and this is where I wanted to get a lesson in delegation. Look at verse 13. So it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood before Moses morning from morning till evening. Now, if you take the average day, and I know, you know, days are longer, days are shorter, but that would be somewhere between 12 to 14 hours a day, all right? He stood and heard the people's problems, all right? That, that would make any preacher weary. It would. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit or alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning till evening? And his father-in-law was just observing the things that were going on. Remember, he was a priest. Remember, he was an elder, older than him. And so I'm just telling you, I love to work with senior adults because they have the wisdom, not necessarily of the world, but of life situations. We could learn so much, and I know I'm at the bottom end of the senior adults, but I still, uh, one, of, one of the thrills I had uh, when I first came here, Bette Norville just took me in and Orville would tell his stories, everything from war stories and war times to when J. Harold Smith and when he did that. And, and folks, there's much learning in things like that. And it says, And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God, when they have a difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. And I, I totally agree with what he is doing. It's the length that he's doing it. All right? I'd have no Christian counselor certificate, but I still counsel, and I do exactly what Moses does. I take the word. You will never come into my office for counsel and not get Scripture. Okay? The Word of God is the best counselor, is what I'm trying to say. And we just guide you towards those Scriptures. So Moses, the father-in-law, said to him, The thing that you do is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. And I understand burnout, okay? And I understand I've had a few folks, and they, in, in our church, 
And here's their statement. You just turned 65. You cannot keep up this pace that you, you, you are doing. And I just want to say, uh, who was it? Uh, Caleb? Who was it that got the mountain? 80 years old? Was it Caleb? Am I right there? Give me this mountain. Folks, one of the goals I have in my life is to be a staff, be, be serving the Lord for 50 years, so you're going to be stuck with me seven more years, okay? I want, I just feel like that's what God wants me to do, and then when I become least or not so effective, I'll find me a little church out here in Midland or somewhere where they'll appreciate, and, and not that y'all don't, I am not in any way, y'all appreciate, you showed that to me, you prayed for me, I'm simply saying, I I have no plans to retire, okay? I, I just want to serve the Lord wherever he wants me to do, be. For this thing is too much for you. You're not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now my voice. I will give counsel and God will be with you. Stand before God and the people that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way which they must walk and the work they must do. So really, what is he he's saying? You need to mentor these people. Okay, you need to find the leaders. Okay, you need to find the leaders. And you need to invest your time in those folk. And folks, I'm just telling you, I was at Cameron Baptist Church, and I was around some of the best pulpiteers and evangelists. I mean, Oklahoma, we were growing. Uh, other than fir First Southern and Dell City a a averaged over a thousand baptisms a year at First Southern Dell City, Bailey Smith. We had Bailey Smith, that year we baptized 365 people. We had Bailey Smith in the spring, and we had J. Harold Smith in the fall, and then we're baptizing. You know what we did with our baptistry? We put a chlorine deal, a pool thing in there, so we wouldn't have to do, uh, you know, do it every other week and release it. And every month, we'd, but a chlorine thing would just stay in there because God was moving like that. And here's the deal. The bigger any church gets, the more organized it needs to be. Okay? And that's why we have Sunday school classes. That is a discipleship time. Okay? That is a point. All of our teachers are leaders. And as we grow, we have to stay healthy. We have to make more Sunday school classes. We have to uh, uh, stay organized. And it says... Uh, Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and the place over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. And again, you know, you can do the argument, you know, well, you know, I've heard this. A Sunday school class doesn't need to be more than 12. Jesus only gave in to 12. Well, folks, it just depends on the teacher and it depends on the church. I've seen, I was teaching a pastor's class and we were running over 100 in a pastor's class when I was uh, at First Alma and it worked really well. But some people don't want, what it turned out to be, honestly, it was a, a preaching time for me, okay, when I took that over. But I'm simply saying, you know, there is no clear cut how many you have in a class it depends on space. There's so many things that go into that. But folks, just because one class is running 50 and another is running 10, that doesn't mean one class is better than the other. It's just that this is the way it, you know, it is organized. And that's the difference in these. You know, it goes from 1,000 down to 10, okay? So he's just saying, you got to have some help. And let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter that shall, they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all these people will also go to their place in peace. And again, let me go back to what I started with. Two million people. Okay, he was moving around 2 million people. I don't know a SBC church. We got some large churches. 
uh, all around. And there's some mega churches that meet in, you know, you, you know, basketball facilities and places that will seat 50,000 people. But there's not one of them that's running 2 million people. All right? So God has a formula even on the largest scale or the smallest scale. So Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. And Moses chose able men out of all of Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So they judged the people at all times and the hard cases they brought to Moses, but they judged every small case themselves. So what did that do? That took a lot of pressure off of Moses, okay? And it just makes sense. And so Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way into his own land. Folks, I am always open for ideas. And I will say this, the older I get, the less I like change. But just because, you know, churches do something one way for years and years and years doesn't mean it's wrong to change, but we need to be open to, you know, what's, what's the Lord saying? Okay, what would better the church? And that's what Moses was doing. Moses uh, had realized that, hey, I got to get this thing organized. And, and really, folks, I have no clue what God wants to do here. I mean, when I came here, I'm telling you, and we were in the old sanctuary I mean, I, I know days that 50 in worship service was a good, was a good number. It, it had just really, really gotten down. You can ask the folks that have been, been here all this time. But, the, you know, when I came here, there was, if you would have said, you know, before long, before, or however many years it's been, it's been over 10, but I'm just saying you would need to build a sanctuary, an 800 seat sanctuary, I'd have said, you're crazy. <laughs> you're out of your mind. There is no way that's going to happen here. And some of you, the nieces and some, y'all been around here the whole time and you've seen, you know, how this has blossomed. And folks, the whole deal is whatever God gives us, we need to minister to. Okay. I don't have a number. I don't, you know, somebody mentioned Easter Sunday. We were, we were just pretty much full Okay, are we going to have two services? And, and when somebody said two services, I stuck my <laughs> in both my ears. I'm not saying we won't, because if there's people here that want and we have that need, when it comes back around, that's exactly what we'll do. All right, so the whole point is, folks, it takes shared ministry. Our staff cannot do everything. We just can't. It is numerically impossible uh, that's why we have committees, and, you know, a lot of churches don't work with committees anymore, don't have committees anymore. But, folks, I'm telling you, and I'll tell you the other thing we have, we have a lot and a lot of volunteers. We could not do what we do without volunteers in leadership and in, in positions of, in heads of these committees, and they're all ministering to people, and it is so important. Proverbs 1 I've got two more scriptures left. Proverbs 1. Well, I thought I marked it. There we go. The proverb of Solomon, the son of the David, king of Israel, to know wisdom instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instructions of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give the prudence to the simple, and to the young man, knowledge and discretion, a wise man will hear and increase in learning. Folks, I don't care how old you are or how old you get, we can always learn. It's just like going through Revelation right now. I'm seeing things I have not seen. I've taught it. This is my fourth time I've taught it. And, and it's just, God is just opening up the door and shining uh, his spiritual light down uh, when I study. A man of understanding will attain to wise counsel. That's what Moses did, okay? Moses was 
you know, could have been, and I will say this about burnout, <laughs> you got to be on fire to burn out, all right? Let me, let me tell you that. There's some people that act like they're burnt out, and I'm thinking, what are you doing? I, I, you know, you have to be on fire to burn out. <laughs> and it says, understand a proverb, an enigma, uh, the words of the wise and their riddles, and here it is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Folks, if you will respect God, if you will respect God's word, if you will seek God's face, if you will obey God's word. See, you can know what you should do, but if you don't do it, you are not wise. Anybody can talk a good game, but it comes down to obedience. Not just talking about it, it's doing what God says. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. And folks, we, none of us have arrived. None of us can say, you know what? I've arrived. I'm as spiritual as I'll ever be. And folks, I hope nobody try, even says that or even thinks that because we all have room to grow in the Lord. And uh, the last part I want to share with you in this scripture, I, I forgot to give it to Steve, so I apologize for that. It's back in chapter 17, back in Exodus. And we know uh, Israel was uh, against the Amalekites, and Moses told him basically, you know, choose some folks and go put a whooping on them, you know, and get them out of our way. And I want to pick up in verse 11. So it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And we let his hand down, um, uh, the Amalek of the, uh, prevailed. But Moses' hand became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Ur, her, uh, Ur excuse me, supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And the Bible says there, uh, so Joshua defeated uh, uh, Am uh, Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book. And folks, I know you have done this, and I appreciate everybody that's been praying for me. I mean, I have felt just bathed in prayer in all of this. And uh, it's, it's been hard. Uh, it's hard. I mean, even I know I'm doing what the doctor tells me to do. On, I want to be in Sunday school, but I'm still needing the oxygen. But my point here is, you know, when you look at Moses' hand becoming heavy and Aaron and her, her, her held those up, I was just thinking about my own life and, you know, what was going on and really, you know, even since Cody has gotten here, I feel like Cody and, and Steve has just, I mean, I, I want to get back to visiting hospitals and visiting nursing homes, and I, I'm going to ask if I can, you know, I'm going to ask my doctor that. But I feel like since, you know, January, they have just undergirded me, and they've held me up. And, you know, they've, they've prayed and we've prayed together. Uh, we've, we just, we plan. We, every morning we meet and we pray together. And I just want to thank them personally uh, for what they are doing and supporting me. And, and anyone else, anybody in leadership position, anybody that's, you know, uh, 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 helping out, you know, I just, I just know it's from the heart. And uh, while I've been down, you've done just a super job. And I want to thank the church uh, for understanding. Uh, but I'm just telling you, folks, we just, uh, we're just blessed. I, I, still don't, I still can't answer the why question, but I don't have to. All right? I just, I just knew and I know, for instance, I got up this morning and my pulse ox was 93. And this is the first time this has happened when I got home from work my pulse ox was 93. So God is answering our prayer. And it's, it is that sweet fellowship that we have together, uh, that caring, that loving 
uh, that Acts 2 Kononia Fellowship. And folks, there's nothing like it. Uh, because I'll, I'll be honest with you, there was times that I was sitting at home and I have never faced depression in my life. Never, I can honestly say. Uh, but there were times when I was just depressed and I'd, I even thought about seeking counsel. I really did. But God just kept telling me, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. And uh, I just thank you so much. Father, Father, <laughs> Father, thank you for this night. God, I thank you for shared ministry. God, I thank you for our staff. Lord, Scott, and Lord, he does such a great job in missions and Missy, and they've come off of two big weeks. Lord, I just thank you for Marty and God, I just, uh, we just love our staff. Thank you for our supportive staff. Look, I just thank you for our people. Look, God, I truly believe as we grow, people are going to step up. And God, I thank you for the group that's here tonight, Lord. They have just, it, it just blesses me that they will come on a Wednesday night. And even tonight, it was so hot, but they got out and they're here. And God, I just pray that again, that we can always apply Scripture to our lives. And God, I thank you for healing. And I just, uh, even in my own mind, I just, I just ask why many, many times. But God, you were silent. And there's some times, even rev le Revelation, uh, we're going to come up on it. There was silence in heaven. And God, I thank you that during those times, Lord, that you have people around us. They just pick us up and they help us. So, God, I pray you just bless each and every one of them, every prayer that was said. And, God, I just thank you for my job. I thank you for people that love me and people that support me. And, God, I just thank you that when all is said and done, uh, it's going to be for your honor and glory. I think I will be a better person, and I think our church will be a better church. So, God, just bless us and God, just again, uh, we love you, we praise you, and God, we look forward to seeing what you're going to do. And God, I, I meant what I said Sunday night. I do believe there's another explosion on the horizon to where every Sunday somebody will be getting saved or, or joining or baptized or, or rededicating their life to Christ. And God, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.